Okay, if everyone could just uh, file in to some seats, grab some pizza if you haven't already. Uh, it's about 10 after, so we're going to start. Uh, do expect a few more people to, fi 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 to file in. <laughs> Thank you for coming out, everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to be giving about a 10-minute talk, just to talk about the IGDA, uh, what we're doing in this month and in the future, and uh, then I'll take it over to our guest speaker tonight. So good evening. Yeah, thank you for coming out. Um, hope you've all been having a good new year. Uh, welcome to the uh, January 2019 IGDA Las Vegas uh, chapter meeting. If you don't know me already, my name is Gunnar Clovis. I'm um, I'm a game developer, and I do I'm one of the board members for the IGDA LV. I handle the event planning and run the YouTube and the Discord mainly. I'd like to talk briefly uh, before ha handing off to our keynote speaker. For several of you, this is your first time coming out to one of our, our events. Again, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, so what is the IGDA Las Vegas? We're the local Vegas chapter of the IGDA and actually the largest technology meetup community in Las Vegas. And we're now one of the largest IGDA chapters on the planet, which is fantastic. This is all, of course, uh, thanks to all of you awesome people showing up to our events just like tonight. Uh, we have a wonderful community I'm really, really, really proud of. We host free community events uh, once a month or more uh, with free food, networking, and awesome industry speakers. OK, then well, what, what is the IGDA? The IGDA stands for the International Game Developers Association. It's a truly global uh, nonprofit professional organization for game developers and those interested in game development with over 100 chapters um, all across the globe. In fact, the only terrestrial continent we have yet to conquer is Antarctica. Apparently, they just don't like games there. If you visit IGDA.org, you can learn more about the organization and the benefits of being a proper member. Um, the IGDA does have dues for like any similar professional organization, but honestly, they're very low and pay themselves back almost immediately if you make use of the discounts for industry shows and that kind of thing that are included. But uh, our IGDA Las Vegas events are all completely free. You don't have to be a member of the IGDA properly. Grover, Sam, Larry, and I uh, founded this incarnation of the IGDA Las Vegas just around six months ago, give or take. Our first chapter meeting was in September of last year, and I'm just amazed with how far we've come so quickly. Again, we're now the biggest tech group in Vegas and uh, one of the largest IGDA chapters in the world, which is all just incredible. I'm extremely thankful to everyone for being a part of this. I'd like to thank Rob Roy, Switch, and the Innovation Center for their continued sponsorship from the start, uh, they're a huge part of making these events possible, and they're just really awesome to work with. I'd like to thank Rover and Wim Independent Studios uh, for providing the food at our events. Um, I think a significant part of our success has been the free pizza. Uh, thank you for, to Sam and Cosmic Squirrel for uh, providing the drinks, very important and kind. Uh, both Sam and Grover handle our social media accounts, which I very much appreciate. Larry, of course, uh, the baller that he is, can, can I say that? All right, I already said it. Uh, Larry coordinates most of our speakers, uh, including our guest tonight, uh, which is invaluable. I immensely appreciate all the hard work you do for us, Larry. But it's all very much a team effort. I'm so thankful to work with all of you. I'm very happy for this group. Uh, we have a lot more planned for the IGDA LV in the future, including a jam site for the Global Game Jam at the end of the month. If you don't know, a game jam is a hackathon for game development. If you don't know what a hackathon is, Hackathon is an event where people come together to develop uh, software projects in a very limited time frame, usually 24 or 48 hours, 48 generally for game jams. Uh, startups usually come out of these, but beyond simply being fun, um, they're a really excellent way to build your portfolio and get jobs. So if you're interested in being part of the game industry, I really recommend coming to uh, these kind of events. The Global Game Jam is actually the largest hackathon of any kind in the world with tens of thousands of participants. Uh, and there's almost 1,000 physical jam sites across the planet. The uh, GGJ was actually originally made by the IGDA, interestingly enough. It's running this year from uh, Friday, January 25th to the 27th, last weekend of January. We're hosting our site at the Konami Gaming Lab at the UNOV International Gaming Institute. Uh, they're sponsoring us. It's all completely free, like all of our events, uh, with free food, uh, free prizes um, for you know participating and finishing something, such as Steam keys and cool tech. Um, you don't need to know how to code or how to make games before entering. The GGJ is all about learning, uh, experimentation, collaboration. It's not a competition. 
People can work together on teams of any size. Uh, so no matter your skill set, there's always something you can do. Plus, we'll have free workshops to teach complete beginners how to make games and mentors on staff to help every step of the way. The event opens at 2 p.m. Friday, January 25th. There'll be some time to eat, network, mingle, some presentations and workshops, and an opening keynote before the, uh, before the jam starts internationally at 5 p.m. To enter, you will need, uh, I need to start this. Okay. Oh my god. I loaded it physically so this exact thing would not happen. Well, that's Windows for you. One moment, I mean, not like, this is a small thing. This was gonna be really funny if it <laughs> ran naturally. Oh, and that's opening in the other tab. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. All right. To enter, you will need to physically, uh, you need to go to the globalgamejam.org website. Uh, it's any time before 5 p.m. that Friday, so that's Friday, January 25th, um, which honestly we can just do on site when you arrive, if you arrive before 5 p.m. If you simply Google the IGD Las Vegas, uh, very unhappy with PowerPoint now. Uh, yeah, that, if you Google IGDA, IGDA, does, La, IGDA Las Vegas, our meetup will come up if that's not the first result. Here you can RSVP to all of our future events, which is extremely helpful to us. Helps us know how much pizza to buy and, and tells people that we actually have people showing up because you know, we can't prove it otherwise. Uh, including the Global Game Gems right there. We have a bunch of different pages for the Global Game Jam for uh, maximum exposure, but we expect at least 40 participants based on current signups across all our different pages. It may be much higher if we attract a bunch of UNLV students um, after their semester starts on the 22nd. Um, we also expect video news media coverage. Again, this is all totally free thanks to our sponsors. GameCo, the UNLV International Gaming Institute, and the IGDA have all donated, donated significantly to us, which we're extremely appreciative for. Uh, plus, we have the support of the majority of local video game development studios in Vegas, as well as Innocence, a local startup incubator, and The Power Group, which is a, a game business consulting firm. We have several more sponsors. I can't yet publicly list with 100% confirmation. Um, if you're interested in having your company sponsor in any regard, uh, please, or you're interested in being a mentor or just need more information on participating, um, I'm the site organizer for the Game Jam, so talk to me about that. And again, just Google the IGDA Las Vegas, go to our meetup page, um, you can find everything there, including our YouTube channel, where all of our talks go for posterity. Last month we had Tom Giudino from Valve Software, who operates Steam, if you want to see that talk. And from our meetup, you can also access our Discord. Our IGDA Las Vegas Discord is the largest online Vegas tech community, uh, with nearly 90 members and growing. It's generally just a casual social server to talk with the people you've met at our events, um, you know, chat about the game industry or game design, et cetera. We have channels dedicated to finding work or talent or partners if you're looking to enter the game industry or work with someone. It's the best place for sure to stay informed on all of our events and everything we're doing with the IGD Las Vegas. Uh, there's a little glance behind the curtain when I was finishing up this presentation at 1 a.m. If you use uh, any of the links on our Meetup or YouTube or just the link right here, you can uh, join the Discord right away. I'd really love to see you there. If you're interested in the Global Game Jam especially, I'd highly recommend joining the Discord. And finally, I'll mention that tomorrow night, while our speaker is still in town, there's going to be a follow-up event at 6 p.m. at Work in Progress. This is not an IGDA event, but another lo local game dev event by Unreal Engine Plus. Connor, would you like to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, so uh, my name is Connor Torres. I'm also a board member. I was on the slides, but I'm a board member here at the IGDA. And uh, we're having a uh, follow-up event that is a practical demonstration in Unreal Engine. So if you're really inspired for, by uh, Christian's keynote tonight, you're like, I want to do Unreal. We're going to have a lesson that's absolutely uh, engineered for beginners, so you can know nothing. Just come with a laptop um, and with Unreal installed. And then Christian's going to go over all the blueprint systems and ParaJess and a whole bunch of stuff like that. So that is on meetup.com under Unreal Engine Plus, totally free. Again, uh, you know what to do by now, just Google it. Just Google Unreal Engine Plus. Uh, 
Okay, and as a respite from uh, and a reward for listening to me, now we have one last thing for a keynote speaker takes the stage. Uh, Larry Cooperman has given us a world premiere for Night Dive Studios' remaster of System Shock. Really love that artwork. Uh, if you don't know, System Shock is a first-person action-adventure game released in 1994 that just defined the genre. Nearly every FPS after that took some uh, influence from it, and it particularly inspired the later Bioshock, Deus Ex, Dishonored, and Prey titles. Night Dive raised over $1 million on Kickstarter uh, to create a modern remastering of System Shock. Larry, could you tell us a bit about it? Sure. Uh, so we, uh, we're, we're actually remastering the game in Unreal. Um, we're using the latest version of it, which is, I think, 4.21. Um, recently, thanks, recently uh, upgraded to that. And um, it's, been a, it's been a great project. Um, the release date of the game, by the way, the slide that, the slide that we showed before was the original version. The 1994 version. We have something a wee bit newer for you, <laughs> um, but we're um, we're we're going to be releasing it about one year from now. So this is still in the pre-alpha version of it, and that's all I've got to say. Let the video speak for itself. Um, by the way, this has not been seen by anybody else. It will be part of a Kickstarter update, but you're seeing the raw footage of it. This is actual in-game footage, so don't tell anybody. Except for YouTube. Audio doesn't look like it's working. Okay. original feel, the emotional context of the game. Um, one of Nitro, Night Dive's mantras is that uh, our video games look not the way that they were 20 years ago, um, but the way you remember them as being, what, what inspired you then. We're, we're, we're at pains to make sure that we preserve all of those elements that made these games so important. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, Larry. Um, I, for one, think it looks really cool. I, I love the, the simple animations and, and the sound design when that door opened. I really enjoyed that.
But uh, Night Dive is developing System Shock Remastered in the Unreal and Oh, right. Yeah, this was the video was supposed to be in presentation, but assume that's, yeah, PowerPoint's not being nice today. Yeah, uh, Night Dive is developing System Shock Remastered in the Unreal Engine, which is uh, particularly relevant to our keynote speaker tonight, uh, veteran game designer Christian Allen. Uh, Christian now works for Epic Games, the creators of the Unreal Engine, as well as Fortnite, the largest game in the world. Has anyone not heard of for Fortnite? I don't think so. Uh, in the past, he was the creative director at Ubisoft Red Storm for many of the Tom Clancy Ghost Recon games. He was design lead on Halo Reach at Bungie. I'm a huge fan of the Halo franchise pre-Halo 4. And while it's not a popular opinion with all the diehard Halo 2 and Halo 3 fans, uh, Reach has always been my favorite game by far. Uh, so I'm personally drawn. Christian was design director at Warner Brothers Games for Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, another personal favorite of mine, and Mad Max. I could keep listing, but in short, the man has a very impressive resume. Uh, he's a veteran and a volunteer program director for the uh, Operation Supply Drop, which hits home for me. Uh, he's won a BAFTA for Pete's sake, so he could talk about all that himself in a minute. Christian, thank you for coming, and please take the stage. So a um, couple things before I get started. Um, so I've got just a few t-shirts here. And I know everybody likes t-shirts. So if you want to win a t-shirt, basically I'm gonna give probably about a 45 minute presentation. Uh, then I'm gonna go take a break and when I come back we can do Q&A and stuff. Um, but if you wanna enter into the t-shirt, then uh, take pictures of anything in here, me talking, the crowd, whoever, and tweet them to me. I'll put my handle up here. And that's how you enter in to win the t-shirt. Because we do these things all the time. Nobody ever takes any pictures. And then we're like, yeah, we totally had a lot of people, we promise. Um, and uh, my boss doesn't actually believe, they just think I'm just flying all around the country just for fun. So um, yeah, that's how you can get some t-shirts. Uh, we got stickers and pins and stuff in the back. Please grab some, please don't take them all for one person. Uh, but if, you, if, if we do run out, let me know, I've got a little bit more. So um, yeah, so uh, I wanna say thanks to the IGDA, uh, specifically to IGDA Las Vegas and, and Larry for inviting me out. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about um, licensed content specifically. Um, obviously I do work for Unreal and Epic Games, um, but presenting to uh, at uh, IGDA's forum, we wanna present content that can be applicable to all game developers. Um, and so uh, if you're not using Marketplace or uh, licensed content, um, hopefully this will give you some information about it, and if it, uh, if you are, hopefully some tips and tricks that you can uh, use. Uh, so I've got probably a 15-20 minute little PowerPoint, and then I've got a, a game demo of something that I built using uh, Marketplace content. So we'll jump right in. Um, I thought I would have my contact information on there. It'll be at the end, so uh, we'll get to that slide. Uh, so yeah, he kind of already introduced me. Um, uh, my background's in game development. Um, uh, I've been a game designer now for uh, coming up on the, the Magic 2.0. I'm not dependent on when you count, but uh, I started as a modder for Rainbow Six. Uh, went to Red Storm in North Carolina, where I worked my way up to creative director on the Ghost Recon franchise, uh, focusing on um, Xbox. Um, then I was a uh, design lead on the best Halo. <coughs> um, <laughs> And I uh, worked at uh, Warner Brothers Games, uh, did publishing site on, on Mad Max uh, and um, early concepting work for, for Shadows of Mordor. Uh, and then I actually ran my own studio for about six years. Uh, we shipped three different titles uh, in Unreal, uh, Takedown uh, on Unreal 3, uh, Epsilon and Hotel Blind on Unreal 4. And then I also um, had my big break into Hollywood when I got hired as the transmedia uh, person uh, working for Will Smith uh, Overbrook Entertainment on After Earth, the mobile game. Um, as we know, After Earth came out uh, with Will and Jaden Smith. Has anybody seen it? Yeah, it's huge. Next big franchise, bigger than Star Wars. So yeah, so that was my big break into Hollywood and now I work for Epic. So yeah, that didn't turn out all that well. Don't hire your son to be your lead uh, actor. Um, but my role at Epic, uh, as my, my title is uh, Unreal Evangelist for North America. And uh, what I do at Epic, uh, first I joke that I spend about 30% of my time explaining what an Unreal Evangelist does. 
Um, but given my background, uh, besides doing things like this, where I just travel around and go to talks and be a representative for Epic around the country, um, both in the U.S. and Canada, we have equivalent evangelists um, across the world. We have two in South America. Uh, we have um, a few in Europe now. We're actually expanding that team, uh, one in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. And then, of course, um, different regions like, uh, obviously, like Japan and South Korea and China have their own uh, business groups. Um, but my, my big focus is on independent developers. Um, so smaller developers using the Unreal license, uh, really being a point of contact for them. Obviously, Epic's a smaller company than, than some other um, software developers, so it can be hard to, to actually get a person on the phone. Uh, so I'm there to be that person. And also just to impart all the various different ways that I failed in game, game development in the past so that other game developers can learn from those mistakes and, and hopefully succeed where, uh, where I did not. Um, so uh, I'll just jump right in. Um, keep taking those pictures. I'll, I'll hand you my, my, my Twitter account here in a little bit uh, and talk about licensed content. Um, so what am I talking about when I mention licensed content? Now, obviously, I'm talking in uh, relevance uh, to video games. Uh, that's, that's what I do and that's what I focus on in Unreal Engine. Um, some of this can apply to licensed content for non-gaming enterprise applications as well. Um, and the general concepts apply uh, to basically whatever game engine you're using, whether you're using Homebrew, Unity, Unreal, Godot, whatever. Um, the general concepts apply. Obviously, I work for Epic. Uh, they pay my bills and I'm most uh, uh, informed about um, the Unreal Marketplace. So any specific questions about licensing and things like that and how it works with Unreal Marketplace, I'm happy to answer. I'm not an expert on all the different markets, so I can't speak to say how um, Turbo Squid or Unity uh, or Marmoset do their licensing. I can just talk to generalities. Um, and also, if, I, if you do have a question specific to the Unreal Marketplace, um, it is very well likely that I don't know the answer. Believe it or not, there's a lot of stuff going on with Unreal, uh, with Epic uh, across the board, especially in the last year. Um, I just found out today that uh, someone asked me about the Android marketplace, and I was like, oh, is that a thing online now? Uh, okay, I guess I better go research that. Um, what interview did Tim do today? I don't know. Um, so, But if I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. Um, and there's always stuff that's going on with that. So... Uh, when I talk about uh, licensed content, what am I talking about? Um, it really, what licensed content is, is any content that you license uh, or purchase uh, to use in your game. Uh, so that can be engine-specific marketplaces like the Unreal Engine Marketplace or the Unity Asset Store. Um, that can be stock content sites like TurboSquid uh, that tend to focus on um, uh, things like 3D models and things like that. And then that can also be uh, what I like to call traditional content uh, license. Um, generally, generally what that means is music, um, music, photo reference, things like that. Um, sites that that you know people have been licensed content for, whether they're doing websites or TV commercials or, or things that are set up uh, for that. Um, so a few of the key differences between those three types, obviously the content in something like the Unreal Marketplace or the Unity Asset Store is designed for that um, platform. So um, if you go and purchase content off the Unreal Marketplace, that content is optimized for use in Unreal. Um, we do curate our content so it, you know, we test out all the content that's on the Marketplace um, so, you know, so that it actually works with the engine version that it says it does. Um, uh, and I believe, uh, I'm not sure how much Unity curates their content, but generally when you're purchasing content, um, that's why you're acquiring the content off that, um, off those sites. Now that being said, with the, with the Unreal Marketplace, when you do, uh, purchase a license for Unreal Marketplace content, you can use that content however you see fit. So if you purchase a set of art assets off the Unreal Marketplace, and you want to export them and use them in a Unity project, you can do that. If you want to use them in a TV commercial or anything like that, um, you own the content, you own access to the content. Uh, the only thing that you can't do is turn around and resell that content either in our own marketplace or another marketplace. Uh, so you can't purchase someone's material pack and add it to your material pack and resell it. It seems pretty obvious. Um, 
for the content that Epic gives away for free on the Unreal Store, uh, generally the Paragon assets and, and things like that, those are only licensed for use uh, with Unreal Engine. Uh, so uh, for those specific assets, we give those away for free, you know, subsidize those assets for Unreal developers, and that license is restricted uh, to the Unreal Engine. Now, that doesn't mean it's just for games. Again, you can use it for TV, commercials, uh, architectural, whatever you want to use it for, as long as it's unreal. Um, so stock content sites generally work the same when we're looking at sites like TurboSquid. Um, you're going and you're buying a 3D model or buying a, a, a set of materials or things like that. The difference is, is, is they tend to focus their content more on the higher range or, or uh, I guess not higher quality, but uh, higher poly count, things like that because they tend to be made for things like animation, TV shows, uh, websites, things like that. So you do need to make sure that if you're going to purchase content off of um, a traditional uh, asset site, you want to make sure and really do your due diligence to make sure that that's something that you're going to be able to use in game. Um, you know, going and purchasing a really cool looking shark to put in your underwater game may sound like a great idea until you find out that that shark has 10 times as many tries as the whole rest of your game combined. Um, so you're not necessarily, um, uh, you know, things aren't going to be necessarily optimized if you're purchasing something uh, for Turbo Squid. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, it might not be a great deal or it might save you a lot of work or might, you might use it in some of the cases that I'm going to talk about a little bit later for prototyping or for setting benchmarks, but just something to really keep in mind. Uh, when it comes to the traditional content sites, um, music, photo reference, First, something I like to throw out is people a lot of times get a little funny look in their face when I say things like pro, uh, photo reference. Um, when I'm talking about license, licensing photo references, generally in relation to concept art, um, it'll be a very common practice for um, people to use pho uh, photographic reference to work on their concept art. Um, and if anybody knows the case of the famous Obama poster where someone did a really ni nice uh, uh, red and blue and uh, white rendition of President Obama, um, but did not contact the original photographer of the photo that they did that painter of, um, they got hit with a nice big lawsuit. Um, because when you do a paint over of an existing photograph, um, the original copyright holder of that photograph owns the rights to that. Um, now, there's a whole stuff that goes into that with fair use, and generally we're not talking fair use if you're doing it to, you know, for concept art for your video game because you're using it in a commercial project. So what I tend to do is recommend it's not expensive to go out and license photo reference. Um, if you're going to uh, find photo reference for your concept artists to do paintovers for, um, it, it is generally a really, really good idea to license that. Um, even if you find content uh, that you think is royalty free or license free, that can turn around and bite you in the butt. It has myself where I, I downloaded some photos off of a free website um, and we did some paint overs over it and it turned out that they were copyrighted by a Reuters photographer. And when a Reuters photographer finds out that they're using his copyrighted work, he has these friends at Reuters that can make it very popular and famous very quickly. Um, so uh, it's definitely a good idea uh, to go out and get that photo ref uh, license. Um, and then the other thing when it comes to traditional music or traditional content, I, I, I say music just because that's the most common thing. Uh, you do want to be very, um, I'll touch on this a little, you want to be a little bit more, um, uh, do your due diligence on the actual licensing contract that comes with that content. And I'll talk to that a little bit more, but you you know, that content will generally be licensed for one very specific use, and they'll generally have tiers of licensing that you can choose from. I'll talk through a little bit of those details uh, later on. So why do you want to use uh, licensed content in your game? So how many folks here are actively working in game development right now? Okay, how many working in other kinds of development, say like advertising or graphics design or uh, enterprise, architectural, that kind of stuff? Okay. And then who doesn't work in anything related to that and is just like here to check stuff out? All right, a few folks, awesome. So um, when I talk about using licensed content in your game, um, licensed content has been traditionally used in game development forever. Um, we just tended not to talk about it too much and it tended not to be super public. Um, the most common licensed content that's been used in video games is outsourcing. 
So in many video games, uh, Halo Reach is a great example. Um, it can be obviously very expensive and time consuming to be able to create an entire uh, game's worth of assets in a short amount of time. And so it's very common to go out and hire outsourcing teams, whether that be um, domestic teams, um, uh, studios like uh, Liquid or um, overseas teams like uh, Virtuos. Um, and I think actually Epic even at some point had an outsourcing team uh, based in China. Um, but super duper common. Um, uh, those teams are still around. They do a lot of business. Um, and in fact, one of the games uh, that I mentioned, um, Ghost Recon Predator, I believe, was a PSP title. Um, and I'm not, I don't think I'm officially in the credits for that game, but I list it because they stole the story that I wrote from a different Ghost Recon and used it. So I figured I could, uh, I could put it on my slide. Um, but that was mainly developed by uh, Bertros uh, out of China. Uh, they do a lot of PSP ports of games. Um, but that, uh, that kind of traditional pipeline of outsourcing where you go to an experienced outsourcing company, you send them the specs of what you need, um, you set up a pipeline with them, whether they have access to your source control or however you're going to do dumps, um, that content's brought in, vetted by your team, integrated into your project. Um, those kinds of pipelines, I'm not going to go too far into that. They've existed. They're well used. Um, everybody kind of knows uh, how that works. That being said, that kind of stuff tended to not be really um, uh, talked about a lot. Um, you know, outsourcers tended to just kind of get credit in the game. Um, and then if they, if they took over more development, like maybe they took over all the multiplayer map development, like a company like maybe like Splash Damage um, uh, or even Treyarch uh, started as uh, back in the day doing multiplayer maps, they would get kind of elevated to co-development studios. Um, so um, what I'm talking about specifically with licensed content versus outsourcing is you're going and generally purchasing content that's been created to be used by a wide variety of folks. Um, whether that be um, uh, code snippets, whether that be plugins for your game, whether that be uh, traditional art assets uh, like characters or environments or rocks or anything like that. Um, and the biggest reason why you want to do this or why it can be a good idea to at least look into it is to accelerate your development. Um, I, I think I can say at this point fundamentally that we as an industry have spent way too many times creating rocks and creating water. Um, you know, I don't think uh, specifically outside of water based games, uh, which one of which I'll use an example as later. Um, nobody's ever purchased uh, a, a title that's not based around water and gone like, wow, I saw the screenshots of that water and I totally need to go buy that game. Um, what's that? I'm sure there are people that will, will mention it, um, but uh, I, I guess my point is being specifically when it comes to water and rocks. Uh, the example I like to use and get into the next point of focus on your game's uniqueness is uh, imagine you're making a, um, a open world uh, game set in uh, the ancient Aztec civilization. So you're going to have this open world game and your character is going to explore um, uh, uh, South and Central America, uh, interact with Aztec uh, civilization. You could have your team uh, in this open world game spending a lot of time building things like rocks and trees and dirt and, and huts and things like that. Um, all that's content that needs to be in your game. It needs to look good. It needs to work good. It needs to not be buggy. Um, but really what you want to have your team on is focusing on, is on that Aztec architecture, those characters, the architecture, the things that are the key selling points and the key uh, visual uh, part of your game. Uh, so at that point, it can be a good idea to go out and look for assets that you can purchase or bring into your, your project. They're going to take that bandwidth off your art team or take that bandwidth off your development team so that you can focus on the things that make your games unique. Um, and that's what I mean by focus on your game's uniqueness. You don't necessarily, you can go out and kit bash um, games together. You know, if you're, I've got an example of this later. If you're uh, you know, don't have an art team and you want to go out and, and acquire art, or if you don't have an audio team and you need to go acquire music, that's exactly what the marketplaces are for. Um, but what you want to do in general, the, the, the studios that have been, um, gotten the most benefit out of using, um, uh, licensed assets are ones that they use that licensed content to support the primary unique aspects of their game. Um, 
The next thing that it allows you to do is to prototype with shippable content. Um, and this is something that, um, that I've definitely learned lessons on in, in game development, starting with, especially when you're independent. Um, the, the, the kind of traditional development scope uh, goes along in that you build your prototype. In Graybox, you might have a beautiful corner that's, that's built to demonstrate the, the art quality of your game. But generally, you build everything kind of in gray box. You prototype your systems. You get them playable. It feels good. It feels awesome. And then you bring your art team in. They start arting everything up. And then all of a sudden, you're running at frame five frames a second. And you have to go back and get your art team to either lower the quality or increase your performance, all those kinds of things. What marketplace content or finished shippable level assets allow you to do is to prototype with shippable level content. Now, whether that is just having... Uh, shipping assets in your prototype gray box phase so that you're getting uh, reasonable information on performance from your title. Uh, those assets can be swapped out later uh, with unique assets from your game team uh, or actually shipping with those assets. Um, you can learn a lot um, from a performance standpoint and even from a gameplay standpoint of prototyping with real assets. And I'll touch on that when I do the demo a little bit later on some of the things that I learned uh, just in building my demo with real assets um, that I wouldn't have learned until a lot later uh, if I was just using Graybox um, uh, for that early on. So the other thing that you can do is you can sell assets so you can actually support your project. Um, I was actually talking with a team a couple months ago that are building a, um, uh, how do I represent it? it was, it's a medieval uh, kind of open world hardcore um, hack and slash. And um, so it's kind of like a roguelike kind of game. So the core part of their game is they needed a lot of weapons um, and they needed a lot of just kind of different armor pieces, a lot of customization, and they knew they were going to build a ton of this stuff. Sorry, I'm, I'm catching myself on my language because I just came off vacation. I'm a Marine and I tend to curse and I, this is the IGA, so I have to use the good words. Um, but uh, they had to build a lot of weapons. So um, while they're building this ton of weapons uh, for their customizable hack and slash game, they actually started putting them up as weapon packs on the marketplace. Medieval Weapon Pack 1, Medieval Weapon Pack 2. And they actually, the weapons were so well received and, and the bulk of the weapons that they were making were generic. You know, Short Sword 1A, Short Sword, they had a lot of these generic weapons. And they saved back their kind of hero weapons that were kind of the high tier unlockables, didn't put those in the packs that they were selling. They just put this, you know, ton of variation. They had 20 different battle axes and 30 different short swords and all these different shields. Um, and they started actually gen generating revenue for their project, um, selling the actual assets uh, that they were making for their game. So that's something to consider as well. Um, a lot of things that you, you might not necessarily think um, are you know, popular marketplace assets like just general uh, material shader packs, things like that. Um, you know, generally, I, I found that if you go out and you look for something on the marketplace that you need and it's not on the marketplace, it might be something to think about putting on the marketplace that you're going to build because it, chances are if you're doing it, if you're like, oh man, if only I could go buy a bunch of lava uh, materials, this would save me so much time and there's no lava materials. It's like, well, maybe there's some other people out there that are looking for lava materials. Um, so something to consider, consider. So one great example of using marketplace assets is uh, a water game. Uh, so maybe I should stop using water as the example uh, of what we've built too much of. Um, but I, I like this, this example of uh, Maelstrom by Gunpowder Games um, because, um, and you can Google, if you Google Maelstrom Gunpowder Games Unreal, um, I used to have the link, but it's a super long link. Uh, this is an article that we published uh, on our website about how they used marketplace assets to uh, really flesh out their game. And um, until they actually wrote the article for, for our development blog, nobody really noticed that they had a lot of marketplace content in their game. Uh, they used um, a lot of the background content, the buildings, the rocks, things like that. Uh, to really flesh out uh, the shorelines in their games. They use a lot of marketplace content, but they actually use a lot of marketplace content for their ships, um, which goes against a little bit what I said earlier about, you know, hey, you use marketplace content for your background and, you know, have your art team uh, focus on the, um, the key assets. Um, but what they did that's a little bit different is they, they used the marketplace and went out and bought a lot of ship-related kind of things. So 
houses and ships and all these different things. Then they ripped all those assets apart and used those to build new hero assets. <coughs> so they use those assets to uh, to reinforce the skill set that the team actually had. Um, they didn't just buy a bunch of boats and throw them in as their uh, as their main key assets. And like I said, nobody really called them out on it. No, there was no complaining about it. It was just the game looks good. It's a, a pirate game with sea monsters. Awesome. Um, but it's a really good article to read about how they also uh, touch base on their pipeline and how they set it up. And I'll touch a little bit on, on pipeline stuff here in a minute. So um, all that being said, things to keep in mind. Um, there are some downsides or things to at least consider when you're using marketplace content. Um, and the first off, uh, the, the biggest thing that I recommend is uh, having a system in place for segregating and or tracking your content. Now, if you've already got a traditional outsourcing pipeline set up, you're probably already set up to do this and you can just plug in marketplace content right into your traditional outsourcing pipeline. Um, but what I really mean by this is, is art teams especially, when they get a new set of content, um, they, they tend to have a structure that you set up for your, your project and the structure that they like working in. So if you go out as a producer and buy, say, a character content pack from the marketplace and hand it over to your art team, the first thing they're going to want to do is rip, a, rip apart that uh, project structure, integrate it into the, the folder structure that they have already set up for your team and have all those assets in the right places. Um, you know, characters go here, materials go here, and skeletal meshes go here. Um, and that sounds like a good idea right off the bat, and, and it, it obviously can make it easy for them. Um, but there's a few things to consider why it's a good idea to at least track where that content is. Um, the first off is updates. One of the big things uh, of a marketplace today is that, you know, if uh, a content creator for a marketplace updates their content, you can go download the newest version. So uh, whether a newer version of an engine comes out and they update the blueprints to match the newer version, whether they simply fix bugs, add more content, uh, you can go out and get that content. It's a lot more difficult to replace that content if you've ripped the folder structure apart and scattered it all throughout your um, through your project. Uh, so by maintaining and at least the, the placement of the original content and linking to that mu as much as possible rather than uh, duplicating it or ripping it apart, uh, I do recommend uh, doing that. The other reason for doing that um, is less important for marketplace content, uh, Unreal and Unity, um, but especially when it comes to licensed content like more traditional stuff like music, where your license may only apply to uh, a single project. Uh, a lot of times if you license music, you know, a composer will come in, they'll you know, do a bit of music, you like it, great, um, you'll sign a deal, you pay them X amount per minute, and you now have a license to really use that music for say one project. And then if you want to reuse that music for a second project, you may need to go back and, and renegotiate another license. Um, that's another reason to keep that content segregated. If we use something like audio Foley versus instead of music, um, you know, if you contract with someone and buy their footstep library and you're like, sweet, this footstep library is awesome. And possibly your license only want, uh, lasts for one project and you've taken all 50 of those footstep audio sounds and scattered them all over the place and you don't know which ones are the ones that you purchased or licensed versus which ones are the one that your team just, you know, recorded a bunch of footsteps. Um, that's going to be hard to track down if you're doing an expansion pack, if you're doing your next version, um, if your game's being published by a different publisher next time and you may need to strip those assets out to make sure that you're only working with your own content. Um, uh, I, I harp on this a little bit only because I've been burned by it. Um, you know, taking a five person team offline for a couple weeks while you sort out everything is, can be a killer. So, um, just having that information, whether it's flagging it in a certain way or, um, putting it in certain directories, um, uh, you'll see when I open my project or if we get into it tonight, I, I tend to keep all my marketplace content just off by itself. Um, so the next thing is triple checking the license. Again, this gets back into more um, the traditional uh, content, whether it be photo reference, uh, whether you're buying an asset off TurboSquid. Um, a lot of different assets uh, off the traditional ones, like I mentioned before, they'll have kind of like 
different layers of, of licensing. Um, uh, and the basic licenses for like 50 bucks are like, yeah, you can use this for uh, a website and maybe that's it and you can't use it for anything interactive. Or you might be able to use it in one place but not in two. So you, your license may actually conflict where you think you're licensing this for use in your entire game, but actually the license only covers for using it in say marketing materials and not in the actual game. Um, so you just want to definitely go through, triple check your license. If you're doing a custom license with someone uh, with their content, you know, ideally you have a lawyer. Um, if not, maybe shy away from doing custom licenses with them. Um, but that's another thing that can just kind of burn you. Again, not to push our marketplace or, or even Unity's, that's a good reason to buy content from a marketplace like Unreal where one license covers all the content. You don't have 50 different licenses for 50 different things. Whereas if you go and license something off, say Marmoset, uh, they can all have different custom licenses. And you can actually even get confused. Um, photo, photo ref licenses are all over the place where they're like, you know, oh, there's this cheap, I'll pay the $10 license, sweet. Oh, but that wasn't for interactive media. That was only for static media. The actual interactive media license is $100. Um, but triple check your license. Don't try to cheap out on it because you know, when you thought it would be fine just to use that photo as a backdrop to build your level and you left that in your game and you shipped with it and five years later someone finds it and then contacts the original copyright holder, you're totally hosed at that point. Um, so triple check your licenses, make sure you're all above the board. We don't want anybody stealing our work and you shouldn't be stealing other people's work even inadvertently. Um, so the last thing to keep in mind when it comes to licensed content is um, like any third-party content, uh, the cost of integration. Um, producers, especially, and designers, you know, we like to look at something and we see like, oh, there's this sweet gun set on the marketplace. There's like 10 guns, and it's taking you guys like two weeks just to make one gun, so I'm just gonna buy these guns and then we're done. Awesome, right? Um, well, obviously there's things to take into consider consideration. Your art team probably has custom materials that they've built for the weapons that, that might need to be reapplied and changed. Uh, there might be post-processing effects that, that might work differently with things that your team has built uh, based on, on how the materials uh, work. Um, lighting may be different, budgets, um, all those things that you need to take into account, um, just like if you were gonna license um, some kind of third-party software, whether it be you know a cloud services software or um, an audio engine or something like that. Um, when you do the evaluation for uh, licensing content, don't just think of the cost um, because generally the costs are relatively low. Um, you know, one of the examples that I used in Epsilon is, is Epsilon was a squad-based tactical shooter on PC and we wanted to have a radio menu for the squad commands. Uh, where it needed to be reactive based on what you were looking at. So if you looked at a bad guy, the, the menu options would change to, you know, shoot this person or take him into custody. If you looked at a door, it would be like flashbang the door or start up. And so uh, we actually went out and purchased a, um, a radial, it was a, it was a radial RPG inventory system that someone had built where the it was a radial menu and then as you picked up different items, it would auto expand with all the different items that you had in your inventory. Um, and because that was built in Blueprint, that was perfect because I could auto expand the radial inventory, replace inventory with, uh, with commands and did all that in Blueprints. Um, the thing I didn't take into account is, uh, this was real early on in Unreal Development, this was like in 4.00, 4.05, I think. Um, the developers didn't didn't uh, do a great job of keeping the content pack updated as um, as new versions of the engine came out. Um, so there was a lag time between a new version of the engine would come out, we'd want to upgrade to the new version, but our core squad integration system was built on this blueprint that was built with an older version of the engine that kind of put lag in there. Um, and eventually, I think at, at a certain point, I, I had gone back and stripped out pretty much everything that was originally built um, in the original blueprint uh, in the marketplace content I purchased. Now, that was okay because I saved so much time. Um, uh, uh, from from doing it that it that it was fine, um, but all content coming in, it's going to be needed touched by somebody probably. Um, you're rarely going to get something that's going to come in and just totally match your art style and match your budgets and do all these things and not need any kind of work. Um, so, sorry. 
Yeah, exactly. So keep that into consideration. Uh, everything, everything costs time, time, money, and quality, right? That's, that's the three things we choose between. So uh, take that into account. So before I get into the demo, I do want to touch on uh, what sometimes is in the elef is is the elephant in the room. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Has anyone in here heard of an asset flip game? A few folks. Okay. So generally, the term an asset flip game um, generally is is referenced by gamers uh, as a, a clone crappy game. Uh, we'll often see you know something will get big, something will get popular. And uh, you'll tend to have a rush of Me Too's that'll come out uh, on storefronts where they'll have a similar font, similar art style, similar kind of games um, that'll come out and they'll, they'll be thrown up, uh, you know, whether it's on the iOS store or Android store. Um, and they'll pay, they'll up pay, you know, marketing to have it hit higher on the store. And, and basically their whole goal is they hope that when you're going to search for, you know, big red ball, uh, you're, ac you're accidentally buying their big red bouncy ball game. Uh, or if you're getting Flappy Bird, you're accidentally buying their Flippy Bird game. Um, that's generally what's regarded as an asset flip. And it comes, uh, the term comes from, um, there was a, a tutorial uh, that came with a, an engine called Game Maker uh, called Bouncy Ball. And it was a tutorial that came with the game and someone very, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial person downloaded the bouncy red ball demo. Um, they made the ball bigger, they made it red, and they changed the name to bouncy red ball. And they released it and made like one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars overnight. Um, and so everybody went, "That's a really great idea. We should all do that." Um, and so there were tons of titles like that. Um, more recently, there's been some backlash on certain titles for using various different purchase assets where you know, gamers will see something that they perceive as low quality and they'll say, well, that's an asset flip. You bought that off a store, it's not original. Um, now, if every game came with a disclaimer and said, hey, you know, these assets in Halo Reach were built by Bungie, these assets we licensed from this you know, other, other studio and, and did outsourcing on, we just wanted to let you know, hey, we put a flag on every um, you know, crate that was made by someone else. Uh, you know, people don't really expect that, but there it tends to be some negativity um, regarding um, asset flipping and, and, and sometimes using assets. Um, and the, the reference I like to bring up into that and why it really is not really a, a controversy is Mr. Fusion. So Mr. Fusion, uh, if, if you've all seen um, Back to the Future, when uh, Doc comes back in with the DeLorean, he drives up and they say, you know, where are we going to go? And he said, well, we're going where we don't need roads. And he's got glasses that he can't see through. Um, but he needs to fuel He needs to fuel the DeLorean. So he whips open the hood and there's this Mr. Fusion and he shoves like an aluminum can and some... Uh, some banana peels into it, and that's how he fuels the car. Well, Mr. Fusion um, actually was first used in a movie called Alien, uh, which the example of the left on. And Mr. Fusion was used on the ship Nostromo as part of their um, little kitchen. Uh, it's hanging up there. You can see Mr. Fusion hanging up there. Um, and Mr. Fusion was actually a blender from the 70s. Um, that some prop person saw this futuristic looking blender, plastic and white with curves on it, and said, ah, that looks futuristic. That should be on the alien kitchen in Nostromo. They hung it up on the wall. Um, after Aliens was done, they threw it in a, in a closet somewhere, and then someone was building the props for Mr. Fusion at the end of the Back to the Future, grabbed him, grabbed Mr. Fusion. I don't know what it's actually called. I should look up and actually find uh, the actual reference. And they stuck it on top of the DeLorean's engine. Now, nobody watches Back to the Future and be like, hey, wait a minute, I saw that Mr. Fusion in Aliens, and this movie's a total ripoff because they didn't make a complete new Mr. Fusion. Um, they just used a blender. Um, but this is a good example of one, unless you specifically really know what that asset is, and you're a complete nerd. Like you never watched Back to the Future and went like, "Is that a blender on top of uh, on top of the engine?" Um, at least I wasn't that big of a nerd. Um, maybe some people are, but it doesn't it doesn't take away from your experience. Um, there's a lot of examples uh, with this in in movies, and sometimes it does go down the road like the Starship Troopers helmet that's been used in like every movie like a million times, and every time you see it, you're like, "Oh, there's a Starship Troopers helmet again." Um, or in between Star Trek 1 and Star Trek 2 when they needed to make a new space station, they just took the space station from Star Trek 1 and they inverted it, and that was a different star, uh, space station for Star Trek 2. Uh, and then, of course, Michael Bay just 
regurgitates Transformer movies over and over and over again, whole cloth, and nobody seems to complain at all. It's just the same scenes. I don't think it changes anything. But um, no, I'm just kidding. I sure he uses a lot of new content, just reuses some things here and there. Um, but the main thing when I talk about the asset flip and when people you know, are concerned like, oh, I want to use marketplace assets, but I'm worried that people are going to see it in a negative light or complain about it. I think the main thing is just to be transparent, um, especially if you're an indie developer there. I don't think there's any reason not to go out and just be like, hey, look, you know, we, we decided to use this, this content pack for this purpose. And, um, you know, there was a, a very successful, um, I don't want to say the name, but there was a very successful uh, Unity game uh, that was a um, like post-apocalyptic uh, game, uh, isometric game. And uh, they went out and basically purchased um, all sorts of furniture and, and appliances and stuff from the Unity Asset Store and just had a whole team of folks just retexturing it all to make it look post-apocalyptic and populated their whole game with a, just a ton of content this way. Um, and nobody complained and it wasn't bad or, you know, there's no bad thing about doing that. It's all above the board. Um, but I think by kind of being, uh, being open and transparent with it, uh, you won't get caught into, you know, some kind of gotcha where someone's going to find some piece of playground equipment and take a screenshot of it and compare it to some other piece of playground equipment from somewhere else and complain about it. Um, you can kind of head that off in the past just by, by being transparent about it, but it's up to you. You license the content. You can do whatever you want with it. Talk about however you want. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Parachess and give it a little bit of demo. Um, and the story with Parachess is that, um, what's the story? Ah, New Year. Okay, here's my story. So I'm a game developer. Uh, I've been in games for a long time. I've just gotten independent and I've come up with this new idea. So my new idea is a turn-based strategy game. So you're going to have two players, you're turn-based, playing against each other. And we're going to have one, two, three, four, five. We're going to have about six uh, different different pieces that each team can have. Uh, each one of the piece types has a unique movement set. So one uh, piece may be able to move in straight lines. Uh, one piece may be able to jump over other ones. Uh, one piece may only be able to move diagonally. Um, and essentially, uh, each team starts with an equivalent number of pieces on an 8 by 8 gridded board. So there's 64 tiles on this board. And we each have one unique piece called the king. And um, so the goal of each project is to capture the, or, or the, the game is to capture the other team's king. So we fight against each other, uh, like I said, turn-based strategy, alternating turns. At the end of the game, whoever captures the king wins the game. Um, it's a super unique game. Nobody's ever come up with this game concept before. Um, all on my own, I came up with it and I built my prototype. So this prototype that you see here can, uh, uh, can uh, accommodate all of the things that I need to prototype this game. Uh, I'm going to call it chess because I think that's a cool name and I came up and made that up myself as well. Um, and so, you know, I can have my orange pieces, my rook. Um, I've got my, my, my knight and my queen and my king and my pawns all represented on there. I can do everything that I need to do. I, I program this uh, in, in, in the engine. It's playable. That's awesome. So you'd think uh, as a game designer, I don't need to do anything past this, right? So I'm, I'm going to build this. It's playable. I do all my play tests. It's awesome. Now I'm going back, going down to do one of two things. I need to market this game. Uh, that's this coolest new, I, I know that this turn-based game is going to be around for centuries. People are going to be playing it for thousands of years, but I need to convince them of it. So I, I go on Kickstarter. I start my video. I'm like, hi, I'm Christian Allen. I made a bunch of games that you love. I can't mention them because Kickstarter is really mean about copyrights. Um, but I've come up with this turn-based strategy and it's awesome. I'm going to show you how it works. About five people, five minutes into people watching pieces move around this board, that they're going to get really bored. Right. Just like watching someone that's not an expert chess player play chess is pretty boring. Um, when I get up in front of a publisher and I need to do a presentation for 20 minutes on how this game is going to change turn based multiplayer gaming, whether it's on mobile or on switch or whatever, um, those executives are going to be on their phone after about three minutes. Right. Because I'm going to be, look, when I move this piece over here, it moves and they're going to be like, OK, cool. I got that. And then they're going to do this. Um, so there, there's gotta be a way to make this more flashy and more awesome and look better, uh, than it does. Now, again, all the game rules are the same, 
on, on this version and, and this other version. Um, but being that I'm a game designer and I have really no artistic abilities, I was really impressed that I think the color palettes are actually pretty good right there. That's, that's about the limit of my artistic abilities versus Photoshop, instead of just Photoshopping memes. Um, but that being said, I do have a demonstration of what I actually built. Um, and this is called Parachess. And the reason it's called Parachess, first off, I, I didn't really make up chess. Um, I stole that off the internet. The whole concept, I, I took it. So, um, so yeah, I'll give that away now. Um, but Parachess is actually built from uh, mainly from the Paragon assets that we released uh, on the Unreal Marketplace. Uh, so if you're not familiar, Paragon is a, uh, or was a, um, uh, MOBA style game uh, with a bunch of different characters and uh, year before last uh, Epic ended up shutting it down uh, it wasn't profitable enough to keep running uh, but we did end up uh, releasing what we estimate it's about 17 million dollars worth of assets from the game for free onto the Unreal Marketplace um, so everything that you visually see in this entire demonstration is all available for free on the Unreal Marketplace um, the only thing that's actually paid is the music which doesn't seem to be piping through anyway. Um, I actually purchased that, um, but then we also, okay, you can hear it. Um, but uh, then we also uh, sponsored uh, a different set of free uh, music on the marketplace as well. So I should probably replace that with free content so that I can say everything is free. Um, but as you can see, uh, what I built is uh, quite simply chess. Um, all the characters are represented. Uh, this was all built in blueprints by me. Um, the initial build of this, just to get the actual characters in and, and, and moving and playing animations and stuff, took me about probably about two weeks. Um, I've actually, uh, in hindsight, the next time I build a demonstrator, I'm going to do something like really simple, like a 3D fighting game, because chess is like really complicated. Um, and the actual rules of chess have taken me a lot longer to implement. Uh, you know, I should have done checkers, <laughs> would have been a lot easier. Um, but as you can see, just the, the, the presentation of these assets using these characters, it does a few different things. You know, one, it, it gives you something pretty to look at while I'm explaining in my Kickstarter video or whatever. Um, uh, it gives you something nice to look at. Um, uh, again, it's tested with real assets. So at this point, uh, my budgets are essentially set. I know that I'm going to need to have this number of unique characters on screen. Um, I've even got character variations for, say, the knight and the um, uh, the knight and the bishop. I've got uh, you know sharing skeletons, but different uh, different character uh, presentations. Uh, same with the rook uh, over here, and then I've even got uh, different sets of character loading. Uh, right now, it's on. Uh, it's randomly choosing each time. Let's see if that shows a different set. Yeah, it shows a different set. Um, so I can I can know that I need to have X number, amount of characters, um, but I want to have this pool of larger characters, and I need to load in and unload because I can't afford to have all these characters loaded and, and renderable on screen at once. Uh, so I run into a lot of um, things that are good. Uh, that I can learn from, i.e. character budgets. Character budgets are something that teams always uh, struggle with, um, i.e. you know how many, how many tries and, and what's our budgets for our characters. You can grab one of these Paragon uh, characters and drop it in and say, you know, as a team, look at it and go, yeah, the, the quality level, the, the try count, the materials used in this character are you know, the equivalent of what we're going to ship with. So we can use this to test and while we're building that character and developing it, have a character that's going to be the same budget as what we're going to ship with. So that, again, you don't end up with like, oh, everything was smooth and awesome and fine, and then we dropped in this new main character in our third-person shooter that's 10 times the budget of what you know the default, and now we're totally hosed. Um, so I'm just going to switch over into play mode here. Um, and there's a few things that you learn, again, uh, by using um, using real assets that you might not find out while you're, um, while you're using Graybox. Um, in that example that I showed before, you can imagine that when I move a character to capture another piece with those blocks like that, you know, probably I'm just going to have one, one piece disappear and another pe uh, piece show up. Um, but by prototyping with real characters, 
um, I can have things like the animations, I can have the effects, I can have uh, the different elements in um, that will encourage me, well, to prototype that stuff early. So when a piece gets taken, we play a death animation, we bring in the new character, uh, and things like that. You may notice that that animation seemed awfully quick. When I was talking through it, you really had no idea what the heck was going on. Um, that's because the animations that I used uh, for these uh, different movements are all default sets of uh, emote animations. And the character, some of the animations are really short, like that pawn animation, and then some of them are really, really, really long. Um, and that's not the longest. Quang, uh, uh, Quang's not in this set, but he's got a nine and a half second uh, sequence where he's just sitting praying. And that gets really, really long. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I learned that, OK, um, that pawn animation is way too fast. Um, but uh, some of the animations are way too long, and probably about three and a half seconds for, for the death animations or the capture animations are what I want to go for. Um, uh, and uh, so those are the kinds of things that, that you're going to learn while you're using real, real stuff that you're going to run into down the road uh, later if you don't implement with uh, working assets early on. Um, another example is if you notice, like right here, I'm going to capture uh, this queen with this pawn. And you'll notice the camera is uninterrupted when I do this. So uh, the character comes in. Uh, well, it's facing a different way. But the, the camera shows. You can see what's going on. Um, and one of the things I ran into when I first implemented this was that the characters tended to get in the way of each other. So uh, if you can imagine, if this board is all uh, messed up, like if I run a little cheat code and move characters all over the place, um, there can be characters that get in the way of each other when, when we're actually playing animations. So like if I capture him. So what I actually do is when the camera moves to, to show the death and the capture animations is actually hide the skeletal mesh from the piece in front of it so that when the camera moves there, you don't end up with this view of these two people killing each other and then this other person just standing there like playing, just you know chilling out and playing animations in front of the camera. Um, again, those are the kinds of things that you don't necessarily run into uh, when you're using Graybox. Uh, it's only when you start getting um, real assets placed in uh, that you're actually going to see that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the really uh, uh, interesting things about Parachess, when I first did it, um, I did it with our first set of, I think, 12 characters uh, that we released. and um, I chose the characters uh, based on their profiles. So I said, oh, I want a big, big looking rook and kind of, you know, smaller looking knight because the knight moves around. Um, and I want to have these profiles that, that can really stand out for, you know, the, the different things. And the first thing I noticed was that the pawns were way too big because the pawns are actually twice as big as they're shown here in this image. So what I do is I dyna dynamically scale the pawns down by 50% because pawns are not supposed to be as tall as all the other characters. And you don't think about these kinds of things until you get in and go, oh, the pawns look really big compared to everything else. Um, but the first thing my kids said when, when I had this first amalgamation of characters, I just had them all mixed up. And they said, why do you have bad, bad characters on the good guy team? And I said, well, there aren't any bad characters. There's just like cool looking dudes and people like, like these guys. And my son was like, well, that's definitely a bad guy, Dad. He can't be on the good guy's team. And I went, oh, OK. Um, so I guess uh, these will be the, they look good. And I had to like vet each character. And I actually moved them around on a different teams because I, had, I hadn't intended for there to be like an evil team and a good team. I, I don't know any, I actually didn't know anything about Paragon. I don't know anything about their backgrounds. I just pick characters based on their, on their silhouettes. And uh, again, these are something that, you know, if we've been sitting doing concepting, yes, we may have come to that as a team while we're sitting there looking at boards going like, hey, after we concepted our 20 characters, it looks like, you know, we're getting factions kind of built in here. But by placing those assets into the game really early on, you know, instantly people were, uh, you know, people's reaction was like, it looks like you have a good team and a, and a bad team. And I was like, okay, I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, so there's all those kinds of uh, kinds of things that you learn, um, and I think then the last thing uh, that I'll bring up uh, in this demo. This will take me a second, but I'm going to open a new level. Um, let's open up. 
Uh, let's go with the, where's my ruins map? You can tell I haven't given this demo in a while. There we go, open ruins. Um, so one of the specific things about the way Paratrust was built is it, it, it is actually my demo project that I built in Blueprints and I use it for tutorials on Blueprints and things like that. Um, but the way that it's built is that the, uh, the chessboard and the pieces themselves are standalone blueprints. Uh, so they essentially can be dropped into any environment. Basically, if I want to make a new environment, I build the environment, I drag in the blueprint for the chessboard, and boom, it's all working. So it's all self-contained. Um, now, um, being able to, again, demonstrate that capability um, can be an important thing. So what I've done is, it's supposed to load faster than this. Did we mention that Windows crashed right before I started this? Hopefully it's not doing that again right now. Uh, yeah, that's true. Oh, here, look, watch this magic. Boom, look at that. Multiple environments. Right there, I got screenshots of them. While that decides if it's gonna load. We'll let that sit and decide if it's going to load. Anyway, uh, the the environments that you can see on the lower left and the and the right, the the desert down there and the Arctic environment, those were actually other environments uh, environment sets that were available in the marketplace. And I just went out and purchased those. I think they were between seventy and hundred dollars each. Um, and then I actually just used their demos, the demo spaces that they had built to demonstrate their environments, and just dropped uh, Parachess right in there. Um, and uh, learned a few things from even doing that. I learned, like in the lower left, you can see that the volumetric fog settings in the in the uh, desert environment is washing out the characters just by looking at that. Um, so the fog settings on a lot of these things uh, aren't really good for chess because you need to be able to look across the board and really identify because uh, the characters on the other side tend to get small. Um, the Arctic environment works really, really well on the right um, to, to help characters stand out, except for the white and blue characters, which tend to blend in. So... Learn, some, learn things that you might not necessarily know, um, if, again, if you're just using white box. Let's see if that loaded while I was talking. No, it didn't. Um, do you usually not develop the mode panel in left, or do you disable that? Everything is hosed because I normally work on two screens, and as soon as I compress everything down, it regurgitates, it rearranges everything into one screen, so um, yeah. Don't ever demo, like if you're working on two screens, don't ever demo on one. It's a pain in the butt. It moves everything around. Um, cool. So that that pretty much gets into, kind of covers the high level um, uh, content that I wanted to cover tonight. Um, obviously, I can, there we go. Gosh. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, happy to answer questions. We're going to do a little bit of a break, and I'll do a QA. and a um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Surrelan, uh, S-E-R-E-L-L-A-N, or if you, uh, if you search on Twitter for Christian Allen. Um, if you tweet me pictures of anything here, um, when I come back, that's how you enter to earn, earn the, the photograph. I am um, both on LinkedIn and on Twitter. I am the game designer, not the MMA fighter. So there is Christian Allen. If he has his shirt off and he's like super ripped, I mean, I am super ripped, but I don't. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, LinkedIn, Christian Allen Designer. New thing I learned on LinkedIn, you can actually for free change your link. So on your LinkedIn uh, profile where it you know, says Bill Smith 875, blah, 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 you can change that to something custom. So, um, And then on Facebook, I'm never going to respond to you. So don't I, you don't need to see pictures of my kids. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and take a break. And when I come back, we'll do Q&A and uh, we can win some uh, shirts. And it's still loading, so yeah, that's good. Uh, first winner of the shirt is Owen Piles. All right, cool picture. Um, next we have Anita Thompson. Yay! I got, oh, uh, I got a bad shoulder. Sorry. All right, and then I'm gonna scroll back a little bit and. We're going to go, well, this person did two, so we'll go with LB Corny. All right, there we go. Good job, everybody. Prove that I'm here. Thank you. Um, so I think we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So um, 
uh, uh, like Connor said, we are going to be doing a presentation tomorrow. Um, uh, you can talk to Connor about timing or just Google it. I'll be getting into like the blueprints and, and really digging deep into what Parachess is and how I built it. Um, but any questions related to uh, what we had tonight, I'd love to answer. Yeah, if you have a question, please uh, come up and get a microphone. And who's going to be? Any the, questions? There's always got to be one person to go first, and then everybody will actually answer. All right. Hey there, my name's uh, Ian Hollenhead. I'm new to the group, love it. Um, I have a question that haunts me all the time when it comes to the asset stores and Unreal. It's people uploading other people's work and claiming it as their own, mm -hmm. and then you getting hit with a copyright later. How do you guys work around that? How, what's your experience in, in being able to fight that and work around it? Um, so when basically we vet everything that goes onto the marketplace. Um, and part of that vetting process um, is doing a review of the content itself. Um, so obviously we look through existing content that we have on the marketplace and, and see if anything's there. Um, you know, we have a reporting system so people can report content. Um, we just recently actually did a big trademark review of all of our marketplace content. Uh, where we actually had to go out to a few marketplace creators and uh, say, hey, you know, we think some of your content, this wasn't related to other pieces of content, but outside trademarks. So say things like weapons and gear. Um, you know, weapons and gear uh, in games that, like, you know, I'll use helmets as an example. You know, if you make a certain uh, soldier helmet and someone can point to it and say, oh, that's an exact model of this this." this company's creation exactly matches this other thing, then that could be a trademark violation. Uh, so we actually went through our creators and, and identified some, some uh, situations where um, intentional or not, there could be a possible trademark violation. We said, you're gonna need to change this content uh, to not match that. So uh, most, of our, um, most of our curation on our content is manual. Um, just going through content and, and trying to make sure that it's, um, that it's, you know, licensed by the, or owned by the entity that is selling it. Um, right. and that's, that's how we do it. Unfortunately, you know, it'd be great to have algorithms that would be able to handle that. Um, you know, I, I think we see in all the different content stores that can be an issue, um, where people can, you know, get content and re-upload it and try to sell it. And, um, we just take the approach of, um, you know, not quality over quantity is how we take the approach. So does that Definitely. answer your question? It does. I, I think it's an exciting time, though. Uh, I noticed the trademark office is taking it a little more seriously. They've been very active on their YouTube in the past year about taking copyright more seriously as far as minimum fines start at 30000 and then maximum is 150, um, plus whatever damage is on top of that. But I think all of us as artists have been stolen from before. Any r real artist, right? And it kills us. But it, it's something that's been taken more seriously lately. And uh, that's the number one thing. I, I, I personally can only use the assets of storyboard I find most of the time to rough stuff out and then to guarantee that I'm not infringing on it because it always happens. Like you said, five years later, somebody tags you and you go, well, it said it was licensed. Yep. And then you found out that guy ripped it off. You guys are still liable for it. it doesn't mean, You can't point the finger at that guy. You guys are still on the hook for it. Um, but yeah, thank you, man. I, I, I enjoyed your talk tonight. I love your insight. Oh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Raise your hand. You got a pretty good resume. I'm pretty impressed. Thank and you. question to you is, what are you most proud of that you've done in your history? What am I most proud of of my entire career? Um, the control scheme for Ghost Recon 2 on the Xbox, uh, on the original Xbox. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the control scheme in, in general, um, control schemes are something that, that these days is a little more um, defined, right? Uh, if you're going to build a first-person shooter on an Xbox controller, it, it, the, 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 the terms of, of how things work, what the jump button is, what the grenade button is, what the weapon swap button is, that B goes back. Um, is like an established thing now. Um, in 2002, B going back was not an established thing. Um, 
And uh, it, it is good that, that that I ended up working on Halo because uh, I, I swore that uh, they they had their their uh, grenade and jump button backwards uh, versus Ghost Recon, but I ended up going to Bungie anyway, so it made it okay. Um, but uh, the the actual squad interaction, I think that Ghost Recon Two was one of the first uh, Xbox games to use a D-pad activated radial menu where you would hold a jewel button, it would bring up a four position menu selection, and then you would use the D-pad to select left, right, up, down to actually have that expanding menu option. Um, and we did that because there was too many commands to fit on an Xbox controller. Um, and so that whole system was something that was a, um, through the development of Ghost Recon 2, um, the squad interaction and, and order system and, and your inventory system, so it actually ended up all using that same uh, D-pad interaction system um, was a huge problem all the way throughout the development of the game. And that the interaction system that shipped uh, with that game was something that I went away for a weekend and just beat my head against with a whiteboard and a controller and said, how about we try this one? And it worked. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that as a game designer you you remember and you think about, but nobody ever really knows. You know, everybody wants to hear like, oh, it was the you know, the set piece at the end of Halo Reach where, you know, you fought and fought and fought and then it's your helmet and it's actually your helmet, even though that was a really cool thing too. Um, but it's all those little, little kinds of interactions, little, little things that, you know, were a huge block for a multi-million dollar team for multiples of months uh, that you, you got back and you came up with this core kernel that, that worked. So, all right. Thank you. Um, when you uh, actually pitch a game, or is it kind of like expected to have like a better presentation or is it Monday's here and like we need a new game idea? It's just something by Friday. And uh, and it's just like, okay, well, do I need to start talking to art, pulling in assets whether from the marketplace today or do I just try to get this prototype in by Friday and kind of pr pitch this new idea? So that's a great question. I mean, game pitches take all sorts of forms, whether you're work, you know, it really depends on whether you're working as an independent studio, whether you're working internally, um, uh, you know, the, there's all sorts of different forms they can take. I, I don't think I've ever seen the, hey, we need a new game idea by Monday, like go come up with one and, and come in. Um, I have seen like times at studios, like specifically, at Warner Brothers, uh, like one of my first jobs at Warner Brothers, I started um, to work on Mad Max. We decided to outsource Mad Max, so I spent time on the publishing team to in due diligence where we ended up uh, uh, having Avalanche build it. Um, and then uh, we had just uh, finished the acquisition of Midway at that time. And so um, because now my project that I got hired to do is now being outsourced, now it was like, oh, and we own Midway, and Christian, you're a creative director. Here's a list of all of Midway's IP that we just acquired. Do pitches for all of this. Um, so I literally had this spreadsheet of like, hmm, Smash Brothers, okay, uh, hmm, Rampage, which I'm sorry about Rampage the movie, wasn't my fault. Um, yeah, it would have been a really cool Connect game. It was really cool. We smash all the things. Anyway, um, but uh, so that was. Probably the one time uh, I actually sat down and just like came up with pitches. Um, most of the time, it's more along the lines of like, "Hey, we've got some downtime. If anybody wants to work on some pitches, you know, for our next cycle, go ahead and do it." Um, now, as independents, um, unless you're making super hot, uh, which or Minecraft, which seem to just gray box is their art style, um, it, I. I don't think it, it, it hurts to have assets. It, it, so you kind of run up against this, this wall where when you're pitching to publishers, sometimes it's better to leave things gray box so that it's very clear that it's gray box. And sometimes it's better to have good looking assets, even if you're going to swap them out later so that they know, hey, the game looks good. The pair of chess example with the backgrounds is a, is a good example because just that floating chessboard, even if I have the characters on it, it just floating in a gray world, you know, people don't really, can't really get the idea of, oh, I can have this in all these kind of different environments and it, and it, and it looks cool in, in different spaces. Uh, so being able to have assets and, and show different environments can be really, really helpful. Um, but where you kind of, 
do want to worry about it a little bit or think about it is, is it better to, if, if you're just buying assets because they're cheap and just to throw them in and fill it full of assets and they don't look good and they don't like help you get where you want to go, then maybe it's a good idea, at least for presentation perspective, to rip that stuff out and just have gray box. So that it's very, very clear, especially to executives who might not know a lot about game development. A lot of times they'll see something and unless it's very clear it's gray box, they'll just assume that's final quality. So whether you may be wanting to, to show, hey, this isn't final quality, it's gonna look way better than this, or these are placeholder assets, you know, that can be something that you can communicate either through using gray box or just overly communicating that. Like if I was presenting this, um, if I was presenting Parachess itself to say a publisher, I might say, hey, for now I've used all, all the assets as you see in this game are assets that I got off the marketplace. Obviously I'm pitching to you as a publisher. Maybe you have another IP that you might want to bring in and replace all these characters with your IP. That's totally cool. We can do this. You can see that it's going to work with these high, this level of quality of characters. So if you want to come in with, you know, all your crash bandicoot characters and replace them all, we can totally do that, but it's, it's up to you. So there, there can be some balance there. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I try to start off every pitch with a disclaimer, <laughs> not final art or, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it always helps to be clear. Um, and also one of the things that t people tend to forget is be clear when it is final art. You know, I've seen people like, you know, do pitches and people are like, oh, that's all placeholder, right? Oh, no, that's that's what we're going to ship with. Good and bad, right? It could be really good. People might just assume like, oh, that's all fake, you know, cinematic trailer that you put together. No, no, that's actual gameplay. Like that's real time. Um, I've had people where I've been, I, I had a problem on Epsilon, which was an indie game that I built with five people in eight months and I presented it to an indie fund and they went, well, that looks too AAA. Like, is that what it's really going to look like? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, that's not really indie enough for us. And I'm like, well, I could turn off the lighting, I guess. <laughs> I could ma make it wireframe. Does that make it more indie? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This will be the last uh, question of the night. Oh, uh, last question. I'm sorry. I could go all night. Hi, how's it going? Uh, I wanted to say I appreciate your talk. Uh, I have just a quick question about uh, submitted content on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so in relationship to content being submitted, is there a way that uh, Unreal or that the, I guess, person purchasing an uh, asset from the marketplace can guarantee a certain quality? I know that in Turbo Squid that there are content that is uh, pre-approved by professional standards. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is that up to, you know, the reputation of these uh, content creator or is there a way that we can guarantee that quality yeah so it's going to depend on the marketplace um you know on on the unreal marketplace all the content on there is vetted to work in unreal so we're going to guarantee that that content is you know works with the version of unreal that it describes and the the user the content creators have to go through and submit and update, you know, every time we come out with a new version of the engine, they have to update their content to match. You know, if they have, say, a blueprint uh, kit, um, if the blueprints change, you know, sometimes blueprints change uh, between engine versions, they need to update that. Um, uh, so you're guaranteed that. Now, if you purchase something on Unreal and want to export it and then bring it into Unity and then have problems, there's not any kind of official support for doing that. You know, um, you, you you could go on the, the the actual users, the content forum and post questions. A lot of people will do that. Um, uh, but the best way is to, you know, check reviews and you can always, there there is a, a, a forum for each, uh, or at least a question thread for each content. Um, and I see people all the time be like, hey, I wanna use it for this specific thing, or I had this question. Um, like on the Arctic uh, level that I showed for Parachess, it comes with some buildings and stuff. And if you actually go on the thread, the number one question is like, are there interiors of the buildings? And he's like, no, 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 there's not interiors of the buildings, it's just exterior. Um, but that's good to, you know, if you have questions and you need clarification. Um, one, it can show you whether that content creator is, is responding to questions, um, because that can be a good sign. Um, and, and obviously reading their reviews as well. Um, to, to see if there's any problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming right. out tonight. Thank you very much.